How far do you think curiosity can drive a person to do something? What would you consider appropriate to further the field of science? And would you ever shift your own values to learn? In this video, I'll be sharing with you eight psychological experiments from the past that will absolutely blow your mind that you'd not be able to conduct today. I do not condone all of these experiments in this video and all contents are exclusively for educational purposes only. In order to understand how psychology as a field has evolved over time, we must look back into the past. My name is Jeff and my goal is to make psychology make sense. Stick around. Experiment number one, sleep study with dogs. In the late 1800s, people thought sleep was a passive or neutral function in the body. They didn't understand its importance or why we even did it in the first place. To help tackle this, two Russian researchers got together to study sleep. They took 10 puppies ranging from about two to four months old and deprived them of sleep entirely. The researchers kept these puppies awake for about four to five days before all of them passed away. Although horrific and unethical, the researchers believed that they had made a major breakthrough, suggesting that sleep is not only a critical function for our bodies, but our conscious minds as well. Experiment number two, Little Albert. Taking inspiration from the famous Pavlov, Watson wanted to try classical conditioning, but this time on a human being. To do this, Watson took a young boy named Douglas and gave him the name Albert B, who is famously known today as Little Albert. He took Little Albert and presented him with some neutral or non-frightening things like fluffy white rats. Separately, Watson would scare Little Albert by banging a hammer, creating a loud noise that would shock the young boy making him cry profusely. Over time, he started pairing the little soft rat with the loud hammer noise. Little Albert started associating the small white rats with the loud hammer noises in time. This caused him to be classically conditioned that even when the hammer wasn't present, he would still be fearful of the white rats. Watson was not able to decondition little Albert due to certain circumstances. And so he went on to live the rest of his entire life with a phobia of not only rats, but other soft white objects as well. He unfortunately died at a young age due to brain swelling and the idea of taking a young infant and classically conditioning them to fear fluffy white things is pretty unsettling. Experiment number three, the monster study. Johnson and a graduate student working under him performed a stuttering study on 22 orphans in Iowa. The orphan children were split up into two randomly selected groups. Each group contained a number of children who had noticeable stutters or speech problems. One group was constantly harassed by the researchers, being made fun of and told that they were less than the others because of their speech flaws. Speech problems worsened in this group and even some of the speech impediments were developed by others. Long-term speech effects have scarred the children of this group and in 2007, there were even charges pressed because of the damage that these children have faced. On the flip side, the other group was constantly praised and told how superior they were. This kind of treatment and positive reinforcement actually lessened the negative symptoms of the speech impediments, and this group went on to see greater long-term speech skills. Many teachers today utilize the idea that positive reinforcement is a much more effective tool for long-term growth and development than criticism is. Experiment number four, Harlow's monkeys. Harlow observed in infant rhesus monkeys that they were highly dependable on their mothers for safety, food, warmth, and socialization. He wanted to understand what would happen if they were taken away from their mothers to observe what the basis of these bonds were. He conducted a series of tests with the primates, removing them from all social contact, some of which stayed in isolation chambers for up to a year. When they were released and re-socialized with the other primates, they emerged intensely disturbed and aggressive. One infamous study is where he took infant rhesus monkeys and placed them with two surrogate monkeys, one being a wireframe monkey and the other being a cloth monkey. He wanted to see if the infants would prefer the warmth from the cloth monkey or the nutrients from the wire monkey. Some of his conclusions were that maternal deprivation leads to permanent emotional damage unless attachment is formed before a certain age, and that clinging is necessary to reduce stress and is a natural response in infants. Experiment number five, robber's cave. In the summer of 1954, Oklahoma Robbers Cave State Park, Sheriff hosted a special camp for young boys, but not the type of camp that you'd probably want to drop your child off at. 
boys didn't know that they'd be part of a social experiment and that the camp counselors were actually psychologists studying them. The sheriffs and their research team believe that conflict between groups happens when groups are in competition with one another. So they wanted to put these boys to the test. In the first five to six days, boys were assigned into two different groups, both groups totally unaware of the other's existence. The split groups did activities that allowed the boys within those groups to bond. Over the next four to five days, both the groups met and were told to participate in competitive activities. The winners were regularly praised and lifted up while the losers were scolded and talked down to. As time went on, the otherwise mentally healthy and normal boys started to become aggressive and hateful toward the opposing group. At one point, after fires, arguments, and theft, the fighting got so bad that researchers had to physically separate the boys. They violently competed for resources like food and water, all the while completely unaware of the psychological study taking place. Sheriff confirmed his beliefs from the study that conflict will arise when groups have competition for resources. Experiment number six, the Milgram shock experiment. Milgram was particularly fascinated in studying the link between obedience to an authority figure and one's own conscience. Leaning off the tragedy that was World War II and the Nuremberg war criminal trials, he wanted to test if obedience was an adequate defense to release people of charges. In other words, Milgram wanted to see if people were just following orders and how far people would take things if pressed by an authority figure. Milgram set up a mock lab where there were three important roles to play out. The first was experimenter. This person played the authority figure who wore a lab coat. The second was a teacher. This person was the unknowing volunteer participant. And the third was the learner who was a paid actor who the teacher thought was a random participant. Basically, the teacher heard that the learner had heart problems and they were strapped up to an electric chair of sorts, but what the teacher didn't know is that this was a fake electric chair and the teacher couldn't see the learner on the other side of the wall, but they were to ask them specific questions and every time they answered a question incorrectly, they were supposed to administer an electric shock. The experimenter would tell the teacher to ask the learner in the mock electric chair questions. If the learner got it wrong, the teacher was to administer what they believed was an electric shock to the learner. The entire time the teacher could hear that the learner was screaming in pain and eventually it even went silent. As the test continued, the shocks progressively worsened and became more powerful, only to finish the experiment after the teacher got up to a maximum of 450 volts three times in a row or absolutely refused to continue the study. There were even signs of the buttons themselves in front of the teachers indicating that the shocks were way too powerful. Remember to keep in mind that although the screams and shocks were completely fake, the teacher thought it was very real. 65% of participants went to the maximum voltage as the authority figure behind them continued to press and prod that the study must go on. Although patients technically could leave the experiment at any time, they were given verbal prods like the experiment requires you to continue from the lab coat researcher behind them to add pressure to the participants and assert the authority figures as power. Almost everyone refused to finish when they were told to, but given free will, they actually took it to the extreme. The stress these teachers underwent was so great that three participants even had seizures during the experiment. Subjects were debriefed at the end of the experiment. Still, the psychological pressure they endured and the mental battles they faced during the challenges were likely nothing they faced before. Milgram concluded that people will obey authority figures even if it is morally unreasonable. Experiment number seven, eye color superiority. Elliot was an elementary school teacher who had an interesting idea to demonstrate discrimination to her class after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. She took her young children and split them into two groups in her classroom, those who had blue eyes and those who had brown eyes. She told all her students on the first day that the blue-eyed group was superior. They even received special treatment. On this first day, she noticed the blue-eyed students performing even better academically than they usually do, and some bullied the brown-eyed group. The brown-eyed group did not perform as well academically as they usually did. She flipped the roles and noticed the exact same respective results with the brown-eyed group the next day. The brown-eyed group seemed to be more confident and fell happily into their new roles of being superior the next day. When everyone came back the next day as their normal roles, kindness and confidence resumed. 
the big takeaway? Expectations and social norms play a massive role in how we treat others and develop ourselves. It was a huge lesson in discrimination that the students wouldn't soon forget. This is also the only wholesome and positive experiment on today's list. Experiment number eight, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zimbardo wanted to understand how social roles would change behavior, and he did this by creating a fake prison in Stanford's basement. He took his volunteers and broke them into two different groups, one being the prisoners and one being the prison guards. It's important to note that the 24 men who were accepted into the study were all examined beforehand for psychological problems, criminal history, and medical disabilities. They were otherwise healthy and normal functioning individuals. After accepting to be part of the study, the prisoners were arrested without warning and fingerprinted at the local police station. They were blindfolded and taken to Zimbardo's mock prison and given ID numbers to replace their real names. They were also stripped down, given prison garbs, and confined to their new cells. Guards were to wear official uniforms and dark shaded sunglasses to not make eye contact with the prisoners. Zimbardo told them to do whatever was necessary to maintain order within the prison without the use of violence. The entire time, the prison guards thought that they weren't being studied, that it was just the prisoners. As the days progressed, the dehumanized prisoners started to blockade the cells and became rowdy. There was crying, yelling, and so much happening that Zimbardo was fascinated to observe. The experiment was supposed to last for two whole weeks, but after only six days, they had to shut down the study because conditions were so horrific. Zimbardo and his team concluded that people will easily conform to social roles assigned to them, especially if those roles are highly stereotyped. It's difficult to imagine such happenings. How many living beings have to challenge selfish desires? These experiments are shocking, but equally as fascinating. Without them, would we be where we are today in psychology? Let me know in the comments below if you've heard of any of these studies before and what could possibly be done to make them more ethical. I know there's so much more I left out and there's a lot of things we could have added to each of these studies, but to keep this video shorter, I've included links and references in the description below so you can look at those at your own leisure. That'll have a lot more information on these studies, including pictures, videos, and much more. I'm pleased to say though that there is hope in all this, that we do have measures in place today like the Belmont Report, the DOH, the ICH, the IRB, and others to prevent experiments like this from ever happening again. We have strict rules in place to make sure researchers follow high ethical and moral standards. These have been around for many years and they're definitely not perfect, but we can always strive to be better and I think that's a massive step in the right direction. There's a lot more that could be said about each of these studies, but I wanted to give you that different glimpse into this side of psychology. There's a lot to learn to better understand ourselves and the foundations of the roots of this field. And I think it's really important that we love, lift up, and learn from those around us. We're all playing on the same team, so let's play like it. So for all things psychology to help you think, feel, and perform better, stay tuned right here on Psychology of Living.